Okay, we're starting now with um, cattle diseases, and uh, we're going to start by identifying some breeds. Um, we're going to start up here. Uh, this is a Highland breed of cattle, Scottish uh, Highland, typically found in um, Scotland. Uh, very hardy breed, does well in northern um, climates. Um, it's a beef cow. Um, and there's, you definitely have to know the difference between beef cattle and dairy cattle. Um, beef cattle live pr primarily on their own out in pasture, uh, brought in a couple times a year to process, um, vaccinate, deworm, um, take care of calves, uh, castrate, that kind of thing. Um, dairy cattle come in twice a day for milking, so they tend to be a lot more easily handled, um, a little bit more docile um, than a beef cattle. So it is, it is really necessary for you to kind of identify the difference between the two. So Scottish Highland would be beef cattle. A Hereford, um, this white-faced breed, bald-faced um, uh, breed. A Hereford is a, a very common beef cattle. Um, we'll go down here to the Angus. Again, a very, very common. This is black and there's a red Angus. Um, very common to see Angus and Angus crosses as beef cattle. This is a uh, Ancoli, um, also known as a Ancoli Watusi. This is uh, originally an African breed, um, mainly beef cattle, and uh, they're now bred in Africa in the United States. Uh, this is a shorthorn um, beef, and you can tell it's beef because of the mus musculature. Uh, any of these guys are going to have a lot of musculature all the way through the flank. Um, Holstein. This is a Holstein, and it is dairy. Uh, cow. Um, this is Brahma bull. This is used for both dairy, here's the cow, and for meat. Um, although these were, uh, these Brahma bulls were originally bred in India where they don't eat meat, um, so primarily used for dairy there. You can see the musculature a little bit better on, on the uh, male uh, than on the female. And like I said, you'll see more muscle on the meat um, cows than you will on the uh, dairy cows. Uh, here's another meat cow. This is a Texas longhorn. You can tell because it has long horns. So the two animals with really long horns would be the Texas longhorn and the Ancoli. Um, I realized just now that I don't have a lot of dairy cows on here, um, but uh, two other dairy cows, and I will switch over to Google because you can look these up on Google. Um, so if I put type in dairy cow and I look at images, go through and the first one that's going to come up is the Holstein. Really recognizable. They can be black and white or red and white. Um, they're very high producers um, uh, of milk. Here is a, there's breeds of dairy um, cows. You can uh, go on and quiz yourself and I absolutely recommend that you do so. Um, there are Jerseys and Brown Swiss and um, I was going to say American Shorthorn. I think there are a couple of others. Um, but what we're looking for is the yield of the milk, but also the fat co content of the milk. The higher the fat content, uh, the easier it is to make uh, cheese from. So really interesting uh, stuff on dairy cows and understanding the breeds of the dairy cows is really important. Um, going to move on. All right, so babies. Um, first of all, we talk of failure of passive transfer. Again, it's really, really very important that they get colostrum. Um, they need to get at least four quarts of colostrum in about 24 hours. So within the first day, they need to get their colostrum. Now, a lot of colostrum, especially with dairy cows, dairy cows calves are never put with mom. Um, they are always, uh, they are, they always are only on uh, bottles. Um, so they start them very young, just on bottles. Uh, mom never gets nursed off of. Um, so the colostrum is collected from the mom and then put into a large system. And that colostrum is used to feed all of the dairy cows for the first couple of days of their lives. Um, we also have some formula that contains this dried colostrum just to increase the immunoglobulins in their system and help with them with their passive immunity. Uh, something that can happen, they can get an umbilical cord infection. It's called amphalophlebitis. Amphalophlebitis. It looks really hard to say, but just break it down. 
um, it's important that you start to practice saying these words. Um, so this is an infection of the umbilical cord. Uh, and you can see this is actually, could be a hernia, but most likely in this case is an abscess. And that just means we didn't get iodine on that umbilical cord soon enough. All right, scours. This is called scours by the, the uh, farmer. Um, but these, this is calf diarrhea. And uh, unfortunately, calves can die very quickly from diarrhea um, because it's a lot of fluid going out, not a lot coming in. They're not feeling so great, and so they can dehydrate and get hypoglycemic very quickly. Uh, based on when the, the cow gets the, starts to show symptoms of scours or diarrhea, um, the, we can tell kind of what it might be. So it starts the first week of the calf if they're getting diarrhea it's probably e coli caused by an overabundance of e coli we all have e coli in our colons um, however and a certain amount is good um, but if it becomes overabundant then that's that's not good um, the next two um, that we would see so after a week um, or around right when it starts right around a week of age uh, would be viruses, rotavirus and coronavirus. Really common viruses of the intestinal tract in small young pets. Um, so that coronavirus, we see it as a respiratory disease. Um, in younger pets, it's an intestinal uh, disease. Cryptosporidium is the last one. It's a really hardy bacteria that likes to live in the environment and is very difficult to treat. In fact, there's no cure for it. We just have to symptomatically um, treat the animal until they're feeling better and their own immune system can keep, um, kick in. But if you look at the age of the, the calves as they're getting sick, you know, at four or five weeks of age, they're starting to develop their own immune system. So it's really important that we support them with some fluids and sometimes antibiotics or some probiotics at this time to make sure that they can stay alive. Um, cows are really bad about putting whatever is in the environment into their mouths. Um, so if they're pulling up, uh, when, the way that they eat is they actually use their tongues to pull up grass and then chew it. Uh, if as they're pulling up grass, there are nails or screws or pieces of metal or whatever in the grass, and they get a puncture wound on their tongue or on their cheek, and a certain bacteria gets in there, it will cause severe inflammation um, and scarring of the tissues. So the first one is actinobacillus. Actinobacillus is a bacteria that causes woody tongue. That means that this, he's not really holding this tongue out per se, it is stiff out on its own. So it's very difficult to eat when you have a very stiff tongue. So they have to tube and tube feed this, this animal until they can get the, the tongue, the swelling to go down in the tongue. The second one is actinomycosis, also known as lumpy jaw. This is when the bacteria actually gets into the uh, tissues in the bone of the jaw. And so it's a really hard swelling uh, and it's very difficult to, um, to treat this. Uh, but major doses of antibiotics, a fair amount of um, supportive care to make sure that they can eat during, this, uh, during treatment. Um, like I said, they eat lots of things. You have these little dancing nails here, and they're, they're grazing. They eat the nails. They may swallow the nails, and as the nails, um, the nails may in, uh, insert themselves or impact anywhere along the skull, which will cause pharyngeal um, trauma and abscessation. So along the soft palate and down to the esophagus, as it, uh, as it travels down, it could... Uh, cause trauma uh, to the back of the mouth, and then it could abscess, in which case they're not going to feel well, they're not going to eat, it may get septic, meaning the bacteria goes through the rest of the body. So a lot of uh, times we need to drain the abscess and then treat them with antibiotics. Anytime we're talking about antibiotics with food animals, we go, oh, is it worth it? Because we have to withdraw off the antibiotics before we, um, for days before we can consider um, whether we're going to use the animal for meat or for milk. And so that's a that's a, a production question. Do we treat or not treat? Um, grain overload. So if they eat, and this is with small ruminants, well, any animal that eats a lot of grain, um, so ruminants or equine, uh, they can get a grain overload, which is carbohydrate engorgement or lactic acidosis. So I'll just ask you, Last time you had pizza or something with a lot of carbohydrates, if you overate, you might have felt a little bit ugh. 
Um, it actually can kill these guys because of the way their rumens are made. Um, it, too much sugars, uh, carbohydrates will increase the bacteria uh, formation of lactic acid, um, which can uh, build up in the system and kill the animal. Um, so they'll get really painful, really bloated, and then uh, if they're not treated right away, will will die. So we usually have to flush out their rumens, uh, give them some fluids, and try to flush everything out. Bloat. So when they do get bloated, um, it's pretty dangerous uh, because we need to, if it expands too much with too much gas, it can really um, not, not only cause a lot of pain, but stop the whole digestive process and um, will eventually kill them. Um, I have a picture of this cow because this is what we call that typical papal silhouette. So it's an apple up here and a pear over here. And that papal is a, a symptom of bloat. That means this is the room and the room is always on the left side of the cow. Um, it is so full of air that you can see it bulging out and it will bulge out high because that's where the rumen is located. Down here is where the abomasum is and that will bulge out low. Now, normally we have a pear appearance to the cow. The back of the cow looks like a pear. With an apple pear or papal appearance, that's when we know we have bloat and it's really dangerous. Traumatic reticuloperitonitis. So let's say they eat a nail and it hasn't caused any damage in the mouth, the pharyngeal abscessation, um, or the you know the woody uh, woody tongue or the lumpy jaw. So actinobacillus, actinomycosis. That actually makes it all the way down. Um, it won't stop usually in the rumen. It will float all the way down and land in the reticulum typically. Um, if it lands in the reticulum, um, the reticulum, this is a weird picture because of the way it, it's, um, the cow is, but the reticulum is actually, this looks like it's in the chest. It's not. Move this all back a little bit. Um, the reticulum is actually located just behind the diaphragm next to the heart. Um, and so that can really cause a problem. Um, the, the reticuloperitonitis is when we have a piece of hardware. See that nail sticking out of, I don't know which organ this is, um, but it, it made it all the way past the esophagus, through the pharynx, past the esophagus, into the intestine somewhere, and now it's sticking out of the one of the stomachs. Obviously, if it's sticking out, then other things can come out of there and it will cause a peritonitis, okay? So inflammation of the structures in the abdomen. Um, the way that we treat that is we will make the cows swallow magnets. And if we give them a magnet every couple of years or so, it will start to load up with uh, these bits and pieces of metal and keep those that metal together, hopefully away from the sides of the uh, intestines. So, um, so that's what we do uh, to help prevent it. Um, the reason I was saying the reticulum is real close to the to the heart is that if it does get if it does puncture through the reticulum through the diaphragm and into the heart it becomes a much bigger problem. I don't know about bigger; it's just a big problem. Or diarrhea in the adult. There are two, there are several causes of diarrhea in the adult, and we have to look at is it an acute diarrhea? Are they like just grazing there and all of a sudden they're just shooting out uh, feces? This is diarrhea. They do have pretty watery stools, but it should uh, go down in, into a pudding or a cow patty, not liquid uh, like this, and it shouldn't shoot out uh, like that. So that's acute. You know, they otherwise look healthy, but they're just having diarrhea. Um, that can be caused by coccidia, grain overload, or so the eating something that's too rich that's dietary. Salmonella, they do get salmonella. Horses do as well. Uh, we do. That's a problem. Um, bovine viral diarrhea, which we'll talk about in a couple of different places because it, it causes respiratory disease as well. And then winter dysentery is when they're all together and it just um, maybe poor water quality and it just causes a dysentery. So those are the uh, five causes of acute. Now chronic, you're going to see that they have kind of pasty stools. Um, it's, it's all cooked, uh, caked down their tail and they've lost a lot of weight. That's how we know it's chronic. Their hair coat is bad. They just aren't getting nutrition because it's all going through diarrhea. Um, so parasites can cause this. The two parasites that we see most often with uh, chronic diarrhea with cattle is our Ostratagia and Nematodirus. These are both round worms um, or ascarids. 
Yoni's disease is a mycobacterium or mycoplasma plasma disease. Uh, it is, um, uh, is also known as tuberculosis. Uh, and and it's, it causes a, a GI disease in, uh, in cows. Salmonella, um, uh, it can become chronic, um, so they can get a little bit better and then just be chronically ill for it. For it. BVD also and bovine leukemia virus. Uh, renal and liver disease can also cause chronic diarrhea. All right, respiratory diseases. Um, there is a bovine respiratory disease syndrome. We also cause this shipping fever, call this shipping fever. Um, we call it shipping fever because we tend to see it in cattle that are under a lot of stress. So imagine being a calf that grows up with your mom on the pasture, and then all of a sudden you're at six months old and you're rounded up, uh, very stressful, separated from mom, even more stressful. Um, you are taken with all your six to six months to a year old to a completely different place, sometimes um, hundreds of miles away in a, in a large open truck. And you're put into a really crowded environment and fed a ton of food uh, so to fatten you up to, to go to slaughter. That's pretty stressful, right? So in that stressful environment, you're going to, uh, your immune system's gonna drop. And then you're around all of these other cows that you've never seen before, and they're carrying different diseases. So these compl this complex of diseases kind of comes in and we see these four bad guys together. So bovine viral diarrhea, it sounds like it should be just diarrhea, but it also causes respiratory disease. Infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. So infectious means it's infectious. Uh, affects the cow. Rhinotracheitis means that we have uh, the nose and the trachea. It's an upper respiratory disease that um, uh, just really causes difficulty breathing, a lot of discharge. Um, Parainfluenza, PI3, and then bovine um, respiratory syncytial virus uh, is the fourth one. So BVD, IBR, PI3, and RSV. Those are the four bad guys that cause the bovine respiratory disease syndrome. Um, just a couple of points. There is a vaccine. It's a nasal vaccine for bovine rhinotracheitis. You kind of think of this, this we could think of this kind of like kennel cough with dogs. It does go up the nose. Um, bovine viral diarrhea. Um, it causes, so this is what it causes in the GI tract as well. These are basically dry pus. So if you've ever seen what pus looks like, so liquid stuff, but then imagine it as cottage cheese, sorry to be gross, um, but it becomes what we call caseous, and it just fills all these pockets uh, within the lungs. So imagine that trying to breathe <laughs> through that. Um, and it also does that in the GI tract, so which means that they don't digest things very well, which then means that we have diarrhea. Parainfluenza uh, 3, I get a lot of nasal discharge, a bronchotracheitis, so they'll be coughing a lot. Um, they'll get a pleuritis, fibrinous pleuritis and pneumonia. This is um, all fibrinous material. This is the, the immune system coming in with lots of white cells and fiber and stuff. And this becomes a real dry material, kind of like scar tissue. Um, so it's, so it's, ca it's um, causing a lot of the same things that some of these other diseases are doing. So then, then you combine them. And then bovine res uh, respiratory syncytial virus or BRSV um, is another one that causes very similar uh, sy symptoms. So um, nice, the good thing is that we do have, or they do get a respiratory coronavirus as well, and they get a um, Manheim, uh, Manheimia hemolytica and Histophilus somnus, another respiratory disease um, that, uh, that we can vaccinate against. So there's a lot of vaccines that these guys need um, prior to um, shipping. Um, and prior to being in a group of others. So we usually try to uh, process those cattle um, about three to six months of age and get them vaccinated for that. Musculoskeletal disease. So most of the lameness that we see in these guys is due to foot conditions. 80%, if they're limping, 80% of them will have a problem with the foot. So we've got to take a look at the foot. Now, they're not as good at lifting one leg at a time as our horses are. Um, and so it can be a little difficult doing the examination on the foot, but we do trim their hooves uh, and we do um, check their hooves to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, 
so you know knowing the anatomy of the hoof is is really important so we have this outer bony cover that we have this lamina that holds the the tissues of the the bone to the hoof wall um, this is where we can have laminitis we can have this in cattle it's more common in horses and then we have our bones um, this is our third digit the um, the second one and the third one uh, and uh, these are the there's just one one of each of these um, in, in each hoof. Now they do have two hoofs. That's your second and fourth finger, uh, basically. Um, the most common disease that we see uh, in cattle is called interdigital necrobacillus. So necro meaning death. Um, bacillus is a type of um, bacteria. Um, so death bacteria. So if you think about it, um, if you can think of death bacteria as a smell, you're probably pretty close in understanding what this smells like. It's called foot rot. It's actually the foot will rot away. And this is just showing, this actually is showing uh, where we can see it and actually how they um, will place their feet to where they, where they hold their, um, their weight. Okay. So if their weight, most of their weight is placed in these areas, that's actually where we're going to see a lot of um, the damage because that's that's what's contacting the ground. Now, how do we prevent that? We keep the environment clean. Uh, we keep it uh, free of this type of bacteria. Um, we trim their hooves frequently so that we don't have any spots where the the hoof wall rolls under and can trap the bacteria. Um, and you just kind of keep an eye on them uh, frequently. Some so that was foot rot. And we have uh, papillomatous uh, digital dermatitis. It's called hairy heel wart. It's, it looks just like it sounds. That needs to be surgically resected. Um, laminitis, like I said, if we have inflammation along the bone between the bone and the um, hoof, it's kind of like wearing either shoes that are too small or shoes with feet that are very, very swollen. So if you can imagine that, that's how it feels. Um, ulcers, these uh, are sole or Rusterholtz ulcers. Um, if we have weight coming down from the bone and just sitting here, that damages the blood vessels here and will cause uh, ulcers. It, uh, the tissue will die and then you will have uh, ulcers forming. White line disease is when we have inflammation um, along this white line here. The white line is between the hoof wall and the sole. Um, where the where the uh, uh, the the bone uh, would sit, and white line disease is an inflammation of that area. Underrun heel and sole or stable foot rot. Um, if we have a gangrenous um, sole here, uh, just from uh, being on too hard of a surface and they're big a lot of weight, or they have a stone under there and it causes an ulceration and then infection. Sometimes we actually have to amputate a part of the toe and then put a block on the other heel uh, so they can stand up off of the dirty surface and keep that nice and clean. Black leg and malignant edema is caused by other bacillus bacteria. If they get a wound and we get bacteria into that wound, black leg is necrotic muscle, so it turns the muscle black. Um, obviously, that's going to be a loss of production, loss of meat. Uh, malignant edema. Uh, if you see these um, big pouches of, uh, like, it just looks like watery stuff underneath the skin. That's kind of what it is. It's where um, uh, body fluid collects in odd places just under the skin, and it is caused by um, a, a bacteria. So the hemolymphatic system is the next system we're going to talk about with diseases. Lymphosarcoma is something, it's a genetic condition um, with some maybe viral component to it. We see it in younger cattle and their lymph nodes just swell up all over their body. There's nothing we can do to treat this. We actually need to euthanize and cull this from the herd. Anaplasmosis, I have this big picture of this tick here. Anaplasmosis is <clears throat> caused by a parasite that is carried by this tick. And it lives in the red blood cells. It's a red blood cell parasite. You should see these cute little guys here in the red blood cell of this cow. I have a picture of this cow. Because if you see, the tongue is white. That should not be white. It should be pink. 
that's an anemic cow. It's a cow that doesn't have red blood cells. It's because when these red blood cells get little parasites in them, uh, the body doesn't like that. So it kills those red blood cells. Now we only have red blood cells that don't have parasites and there's just not enough of them. So tick causing anaplasmosis, causing anemia in the cow. Um, anthrax is a zoonotic disease, deadly disease that affects cows um, from a biting fly. The biting fly will <clears throat> bite an infected animal and then transfer it to another animal. It could be sheep, could be cow, could be human. We can inhale it, they can inhale it, we can ingest it, they can ingest it. So there's a lot of different ways that we can get anthrax. Um, the uh, the most common cause for seeing a bunch of cows dead together in the field, there are, there are two common causes. One is that there is a lightning strike uh, that hit one of them and they were all touching each other. So lightning strike or anthrax. If this is anthrax because we can inhale, ingest these anthrax spores, or if there's a biting fly that's biting them and biting us, they don't, do not recommend that you go near them without um, um, a USDA official. They actually take care of it. You just call, report it. They test for anthrax. And then if the animals do have anthrax, they you have to big, uh, bury them. Um, you can't burn them because if you burn them, um, that those anthrax spores will be spread. Um, this is an example of an anthrax lesion on a human. It's just a melting ulcer really bad. Uh, and this is an example of the spores that can be seen under the microscope. So anthrax is bad um, and uh, we have to be really careful when we see large groups of dead animals. Okay, so cattle mammary gland is really, really important um, for production. So if you think about it, you, you're probably saying, well, I can understand that for dairy cow, but not for beef cow. Well, the primary goal for beef cattle is to have one live calf a year and that calf if it's a female is going to either go to to build up the herd or it's going to go for meat so bringing up that that female calf uh, is really important so they have to eat really well which means the mammary glands have to be functioning correctly from the mom um, or if it's a male calf typically that one's going to go directly to production so again they have to grow really quickly so the mammary glands are extremely important both in dairy and beef cattle um, there are a couple different types of um, mastitis one is the contagious and the other is environmental contagious are um, passed by either streptococcus or staphylococcus bacteria and they go from cow to cow so if you are um, milking a cow with that has uh, mastitis and has streptococcus or staphylococcus and you don't go you don't clean her and you don't go to the next you don't clean the next cow and then you are responsible for um, for um, spreading the contagion environmental um, uh, mastitis is caused from bacteria that is commonly in the environment so here's a really good picture to to show you this because this animal is lying down in a pile of feces and this is really bad mastitis that has abscessed and broken open this there's no saving this animal at this point you'd have to amputate the entire uh, mammary gland um, I have to realize the anatomy of the mammary gland is such that there is an opening there's a lot of uh, immune um, uh, processes here that keep the bacteria from really traveling up but it is possible for bacteria to travel up this tea canal and cause infection in here and once it gets seeded in there it's really hard to get rid of it because there's all these little byways and canals and cul-de-sacs etc that makes it um, makes it difficult uh, to to get everything out so we do have to be be careful um, streptococcus dysgalactiae and streptococcus uberus um, these are two that are both in the environment and contagious so if you have it in your environment you have to be very very careful not to pass it on um, dystocia uh, dystocias are fairly common um, we try to breed for biggest calf possible uh, so we do have to be careful um, this guy here is a mini a cow a dexter cow uh, and de dexter cows do produce uh, larger offspring they do tend to have more dystocias uh, than 
normal sized cows. Uh, so here's an example of a calf uh, trying to make its way out uh, and having difficulty. So we have um, processes. This is called a calf jack. And this, these parts go up against the pelvis of the cow. And we hook something to the, the nasal cavity of the cow. And we ratchet that cow at, calf out. I have seen farmers pull calves out with tractors. Um, sometimes it's that brutal. We have to get that calf out. If we can't get the calf out uh, and the cow's life is in danger, there have been times when the calf is, is, needs to be um, cut into pieces. We call that a phytotomy. Uh, and uh, usually at this point, the calf is dead. And so it doesn't hurt the calf. If the calf is not dead, it is possible to euthanize the calf. Uh, prior to um, cutting it to pieces and then uh, pulling out the pieces one by one. But sometimes we have to do that in order to save the cow. Not common, but it happens. Some, pro some other problems. So they could hold on to the placenta. Now, uh, horses, we talked about horses, their placenta must come out within a couple of hours. Cows, it can be a couple of days. Um, so this is a cow's placenta that is hanging out. Um, she's not immediately given birth, so it's probably been a day or so. Um, it's not dripping blood or anything. Um, so we wanna slowly pull that out. We don't, wanna, we don't want to get in there and really help her uh, pull it out unless it's been three or more days. And then we wanna um, very carefully flush it out. We wanna make sure we have all parts of the placenta. And we will look through it to make sure that we have all parts of the placenta. I have seen some um, Farmers tie milk jugs uh, to these partially full milk jugs to these um, placentas to, to provide slow traction to pull the placentas out, and it tends to work. If we retain any of the placenta in the uterus, that can cause some major infections and they possibly and scarring of the uterus and can make it difficult for them to breed again. This is a prolapsed uterus, and this is fairly common, especially in really high producing cows. Um, this cow is being tied down in position so she can't um, get up so that they can push this back in. Um, I have spent up to eight hours pushing. You can see how big this is and that opening to the cow is sometimes about half the size of the size of the uterus. And so we have to cl clean this off, get it away from all this muck here, clean it off um, and push it back in and then suture her closed temporarily until the scar tissue forms and she can keep that uterus in herself. But if they prolapse their uterus once, they have a tendency to do it again. So oftentimes uh, that cow is milked out and then um, culled from the herd. So prolapse uterus can be no fun as well. Periparturant hypocalcemia, also known as milk fever. This is when we have low calcium because uh, they've just used all their calcium to contract the muscles for birthing, and then they have their milk coming down or the colostrum coming down. So they've, they've just lost all their calcium. Uh, and what you will see every single time is their head will spontaneously turn to the left. They don't control this, they just, their head turns to the left. Every single time, they will look to the left side. So if I ever show you a picture of this, and you see a calf in the background, you can be sure that it is milk fever or periparturant hypocalcemia. So all we need to do with this is find the jugular and uh, slowly give her some calcium uh, and dextrose and get her uh, calcium levels back up. We do it slowly because if you do it too fast, you can stop her heart. And she'll be up in an atom and doing fine in just a few minutes. Ketosis or acetonomia. I'm sure you've heard of the ketosis or ketotic diet where people actually put themselves into a, a state where they are um, ketotic or breaking down fat abnormally. Well, it's, uh, while it's great to break down fat, if you do it too much, um, this fat goes through the rest of your body systems and the rest of your organs and can cause organ failure. So um, I do caution you against doing a keto, um, keto diet uh, because it is very, very difficult to do correctly without doing organ damage. Um, so as an example, we see this as a problem with animals that are diabetic. Um, and then we also see it in cows 
um, after birth, where they're high producers, especially cows that are overweight prior to giving birth. So we have to keep their weight. This animal doesn't look like she was overweight prior to birth, but she was. And this is a um, chronic ketotic uh, animal. So what we do is we do a urine test. Fun fact, a way to get urine from a cow, and I, I have uh, that uh, video for you in chapter 18, I believe. Um, you stroke the, the vulva um, or the, um, uh, the area between the anus and the vulva. Uh, and if you uh, stroke it a couple of times, they actually urinate on their own. So that's how we get the urine. And if it shows that we are positive for ketones in the urine, that means we need to give her some, um, uh, some propylene glycol with some sugars uh, to help her body realize that she's not starving um, so she doesn't go into organ failure. So here's the cardiovascular stuff with um, vegetative or valvular endocarditis. So any infections uh, within their bloodstream um, as, they go, as it goes through the bloodstream can end up on their valves. And this is what we see. We see this in horses. We see this in, with mitral valve disease in dogs. Um, we get this in, these, the bacteria that, that um, uh, sits on these valves. You can see that this is just not a normal valve. These leaflets should be nice and smooth. And it just looks like cauliflower, so vegetative, right? Um, and it causes, obviously, heart disease. Um, the pericarditis, be, uh, because of um, traumatic pericarditis, so if we have a uh, uh, needle or screw or nail or bit of metal that goes from the retic um, reticulum into the heart uh, wall, it will cause infection and inflammation um, around the heart itself and cause some damage to the heart. So. Uh, this is showing some edema or some swelling down here due to the heart uh, being damaged. Um, cattle do get rabies as well, so anything neurologic with them, frothing at the mouth, standing weirdly, uh, got their head turned to the side, sudden death, we do need to test them for rabies. Um, the only way to test for rabies for any animal is to cut the head off uh, and to send that away to the, um, the state lab. Um, Polio or polioencephalomalacia uh, can be due to a thiamine deficiency. That's a, a vitamin B deficiency. So if they don't have enough vitamin B in their forage or in their supplements, um, then they can get um, polioencephalomalacia, which is inflammation of the brain. Listeriosis. List listeria is a bacteria that lives uh, in uh, wet areas primarily. Um, and is passed by rodents. Um, and if they're drinking from puddles, et cetera, where rodents have been running through, um, they can get listeria, which causes the neurologic conditions. Um, we've seen, uh, see, I think it was Bluebell was the most recent one in the last couple of years. Listeria is a bacteria that loves frozen environments. And so it will live in ice cream. So if you have an outbreak of listeria in your uh, cattle farm, it's possible that it will get to the uh, ice cream factory. So um, thromboembolic meningioencephalitis or TEAM is called is caused by Haemophilus somnus bacteria, um, which we saw earlier as a respiratory disease, also causes neurologic disease as well. So it just causes a softening of the um, spinal cord. Their eyes, they do get pink eye, uh, infectious uh, bovine keratoconjunctivitis. Um, it's something that uh, we need to be careful of. It is, it's um, can be zoonotic. Um, the way that we treat it, we put we put medication in the eye, and then we um, glue the eye shut and put an eye patch over it. And just until the glue wears off, that medication will stay in the eye and it will treat it. Um, cutaneous papillomas or warts are pretty common uh, and they are uh, we can we can transfer them from teat to teat so we can transfer them um, probably a, um, a sexually transmitted disease they do tend to go away on their own uh, so there's not a lot of treatment there dermatophytosis or ringworm they get ringworm um, these fungal infections probably even more so than horses do they tend to be in closer environments more often uh, rubbing up against each other so when we do have an outbreak of ringworm we typically have to treat that topically for every animal 
They also get rain scald, so these paintbrush lesions where we're losing hair um, due to streptotrichosis or strep uh, streptococcus, bacterial infection of the skin where it's just stayed wet for a long period of time. Urinary-wise, uh, they can get, um, there's a bacteria called Corinobacterium renal, which causes this really nasty red pus-filled urine. So that whenever I see this, I think this, and I think Corinobacterium renal. So uh, it causes a pus in the urine. If you have any questions about cattle, um, about any diseases we didn't um, cover that you might be familiar with, uh, or anything that you're curious about, let me know.